Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for coming to our panel today. It's co-sponsored by the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund, the Coalition Against Gender Violence, and the Criminal Law Society. We chose to pair the speakers together for our panel today in order to bring some attention to the link that has been found between animal cruelty and domestic violence. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of quick background on this topic before turning things over to our panelists. Many victims of domestic violence report that their abuser has hurt, killed, or threatened family animals. Killing, harming, or threat, threats to, to harm animals are weapons used by abusers to manipulate their victims. The violence trickles down to the animals when the children who are products of violent home, homes commit cruelty upon their household pets. In fact, children represent one-fifth of domestic animal cruelty cases. Children who, are witnesses, children who witness animal abuse are also at greater risk of becoming abusers, and statistically, abusers of animals are five times as likely to harm humans. Many violent offenders committed childhood acts of animal abuse. There are many ways the law can assist, and laws that protect victims of domestic violence will help protect animals too. Legal remedies can include laws that put custody of companion animals directly into legal protection orders, which allow judges to help human and animal victims. Today's panelists will address animal cruelty and domestic violence as interconnected as well as distinct concerns. You will hear first from Elizabeth Heron, who is a legal advocate with the Durham Crisis Response Center. The Durham Crisis Response Center provides comprehensive shelter and support services in the Durham area to survivors and their families in the aftermath of domestic and sexual violence. Through the center's legal advocacy service, staff and volunteers provide court accompaniment, advocacy, and assistance with protection orders. You will then hear from Marie and Sarah, who prior to serving the County of Durham as EEO counsel, served as a senior assistant county attorney in that capacity, she represented county clients, such as the Office of the Sheriff, who oversees animal welfare cases, including the prosecution of animal abuse. I'll now turn things over to our panelists. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Can you guys hear me okay? Is this loud enough? Okay. Um, so my name's Liz. I am one of the legal advocates with the Durham Crisis Response Center. I'm not an attorney. Um, my background, so I'm a licensed counselor. Um, initially, I did my undergrad here at NC State, moved to New Orleans, and did my master's down there. Um, there I worked for the district attorney's office as a domestic violence victim advocate for three years. Um, they're designed a little differently than the district attorney's offices in Wake County and Durham. Those are the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, and then I moved back, worked for the Wake County DA's office for a year in the felony domestic violence unit. Um, and now I've been with DCRC for about four months as a legal advocate. So um, a lot of my experience is working with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, there, I'll just start this by saying there absolutely is a huge correlation between domestic violence and animal abuse. Um, Part of what I do, so I'm over in the Durham, Durham County Courthouse every day now. So I work with um, victims who come in. The majority of what we're doing right now is working with victims who want to file protective orders. A lot of our victims also have criminal cases where they are victims in criminal cases as well. Um, so we can provide, we go to court with them. Um, really, we try to provide any services we can to assist them in any way. Um, a lot of you know, what we do is safety planning. We do a lot of safety planning with our victims as well as with their animals. So um, a lot of our cases, we'll have a victim come in and they maybe they've reported to the police, maybe they haven't. Um, either way, they're wanting to file a protective order or see what their options are um, through the legal system. Um, some of them have stayed in their relationship. It's actually very common for somebody to stay in a relationship because of their pet. Um, they're concerned for their pet safety. They also are concerned if they try to leave, where are they gonna take their pet? So part of what we do is try to assist them with making sure that they can't, if, if they choose to leave, again, some of them might be safer staying in the environment they're in. I know that might sound odd, um, but there's a number of reasons why they might be safer in their environment at the time um, until they have a good safety plan in place to help them leave safely. Um, so what we can do is if they, if they do choose to leave, um, that is one thing that we will work with them on is putting together a safety plan of when they're going to leave as well as if they have a pet, what are we going to do with the pet? 
So part of what DCRC, we do have a shelter. Um, we have a fairly small shelter. I think we only have about 14 beds. Um, hopefully we will be able to expand our shelter. Um, we do work with the other counties close by if we need to refer somebody to a shelter. So our shelter right now, as far as bringing animals to the shelter, we can try to work with a client to take their animal. Right now, the animal has to be declared as a companion animal or like a therapy animal. Um, but what we can do is we can also work with them to try to find a safe place. If there's somebody who could foster their pet, if they're gonna go into the shelter for a while, or if they have to go to a shelter in another county, um, we can try to work with them to make sure their pet is gonna be fostered or taken care of um, temporarily while they're in the shelter until we can find a safe place for them to move to afterwards with their pet. Um, one thing I did bring, we can pass this around in a, lo a little while just to show you all where there is an option where if a victim comes in and they are concerned about their pet, they can actually ask for possession of the pet in the home. Um, some judges will grant that, some won't. Most of the time from what I've seen, judges will. If a victim um, talks about, discloses, um, if there's any animal abuse to the animal from the defendant, um, usually they will grant it. But a lot of times if the, if the victim is asking for the pet, they will be granted possession of that pet. Um, a lot of the behaviors, what we see with batterers is they use the pet, um, as, it's a controlling, it's kind of a manipulative behavior. So they, they will maybe hurt the pet to show, um, you know, what they're capable of. So sometimes we will have clients who come in and um, don't know what to do because maybe they haven't been physically assaulted themselves yet, but their pet has. Um, you'll see that also common with children in the home too. Um, but sometimes we'll see where the pet has been abused first before the physical abuse actually happened to the victim. And it is, it's a way, um, it's a controlling behavior. Sometimes, you know, the defendant will use it to show his power. We'll also use, and again, we have male and female victims. So you'll kind of, you might hear me say him, her, but we have, we have male and female victims. So this applies across the board. Um, we'll hear, you know, he, I can give you a specific case um, I recently had where he, you know, was intoxicated and started to hit her dog. This was not uncommon when um, he was intoxicated and started to hit her dog. And she got so concerned at the amount of force he was using against the dog that she tried to get him to stop hitting the dog. And then he turned and assaulted her um, and ended up strangling her. So you see that the escalation is there. Um, it started with the pet and then it turned towards her. So sometimes victims will stay because they are, too, they are just way more concerned about their pet, which is understandable. I have two dogs myself, so I, you know, I love animals. So it's, it's really difficult when you see these cases. Um, if there's children in the home, another way, you know, that batterers kind of use the pet to control is if there's children in the home, unfortunately they might abuse the animal because they know that the child cares for the animal and that you know the parent is going to do whatever it takes to keep the child safe and happy um so and you'll see we had a case involving um horses so the couple was married and they owned horses um, it became, you know, they had to go through a separation. Um, we did have a protective order filed where she did ask for possession of the horses as well. Sometimes there, you know, there are animals that you might not think that we, we most of the cases we see, you're going to be looking at a dog and a cat, but there are other cases like that where you're involving other animals. Um, and, you know, in this case, she, before their marriage, she had purchased these horses um, they got married, and he was trying, at that point, he wanted to sell the horses. So, again, it was something he was kind of using um, financially against her. She was granted the horses in the end, but it took about three months um, for them to be able to go through the court process to get that resolved. So, you know, again, um, there's a lot of, of power and control you'll see in domestic violence cases, and unfortunately, animals are part of that. So does anybody have any questions so far? No? 
Okay. So what I what I can talk about too. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. What started the conflict? He, they got into an argument. He came home and they started arguing. Right. So sometimes, you know, sometimes you will see um, offenders do have some mental health issues. You know, we have victims who also have mental health issues. Um, it, it's hard to say, you know, I did not speak to that particular defendant myself. And, um, you know, it's something where when you go through a criminal case or even civil cases, sometimes you can refer that that defendant to be to get um, an evaluation done. So I personally did not speak with him, but I do think that you will see some, whether, whether it is maybe drug use. Um, we do hear that a lot of times where the defendant, you know, the defendant is great, but when he uses drugs, he becomes violent, okay? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times defendants, they, they grew up seeing that in their own home. Um, you know, they, they might have been a victim themselves when they were younger. They might have been abused as well. So that's not uncommon that you'll see that. So, you know, a lot of it is you can also refer these, those defendants, you can refer them to try to get help. And a lot of, of what the criminal system will do, um, at least in lower level, like misdemeanors or lower level felonies, sometimes if somebody's convicted, a lot of times they will try to refer them to get some kind of treatment. Um, right now there is a 26 week long, it's a state certified abuser treatment program. So a lot of defendants, if they're convicted, um, or, you know, if they plead guilty or are found guilty, they will be sentenced to this 26 week long abuser treatment program where it can maybe address and try to really get to the root of, um, where their anger or where their violence is coming from. And so that's part of that treatment program that they'll try to. Sometimes uh, the district attorney's office will also recommend substance abuse treatment. If we know, if we talk to a victim and, you know, the victim says that there's heavy use of substance, they're like, this is the problem. A lot of times they'll try to set um, the defendant up with that to, to try to get them some help. So this doesn't happen again, you know, because it's not uncommon that especially when you're looking at domestic violence that, you know, when we speak with a victim, they don't necessarily want the relationship to end. They want the violence to stop. But they might, you know, when you look at it, they, re they really loved this person. Um, they've been in a relationship. They might share children with them. You know, there's a lot of factors that play into why they don't want this person just to be in jail. Like they, they really want them to get help and they just want the violence to stop. So, and they've seen a side, you know, they've, they, they can sit and tell you, they know the defendant, they know how caring, you know, he or she can be. Um, and maybe this is out of character for them. So it's, you know, it's really taking the time to listen to what a, a victim has to say to you to try to be able to offer the best help. Um, I don't know if, if that answered your question, but hopefully that helped a little. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Okay. So she might be able to answer that a little better um, when we get to that. But as far as from what I've seen in my experience, so this is part of, we'll pass this around. So this is actually the Civil um, Domestic Violence Protective Order. If, um, if a client does check the box, there's a couple boxes in here and I've highlighted them so you all can look. If a client checks that box that they want possession of the animal, if the judge um, grants that, so typically the initial part of filing a protective order, um, a victim comes in, they file, they go in front of the judge that day for their initial hearing. It's for the ex parte hearing. 
that is going to be granted for 10 days. It's temporary, okay? So if the judge were to grant them possession of that animal, they would have possession. That animal would be safe with them for 10 days. They'll be given a hearing date where they come back in 10 days. At that time, the defendant hopefully will have been served with this because he has to be notified. Um, he will then come in, they'll have an actual hearing where both parties are able to say their piece. And at that time, the judge will determine if they're gonna grant it for a year. They refer to that as a permanent protective order. It's good for a year. Um, so if the judge were to grant possession of the animal at that time, they would be granted possession for the year. Now, we do have a lot of victims who will come in to get renewals. They've been granted their order for a year. If they come in before the order expires, they can actually get a renewal and get it renewed for two years. So at that point, if they filed to protect the animal and it was granted, they can continue to keep possession and protect that animal. Um, and it says in there, um, I think that the, the you know, they can't abuse, um, harass, stalk the victim, but also apply to the animal or any member of the victim's family as well. So the animal could be protected um, through that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I'll talk briefly to you about um, law enforcement. And I know some of the questions that law enforcement can ask, um, we'll see it sometimes in some of the cases where we're working with a victim um, where there's criminal charges, is law enforcement can ask if there is any animal abuse going on in the home. Um, sometimes you'll see if they respond to the home and there's a child in the home, um, they can ask the child if, you know, if there's a pet, if their pet has been hurt. Um, because sometimes children might be more likely to talk about the abuse that happened to their pet than themselves. So it's another way to kind of find out if there actually is um, animal abuse going on in the home as well, is just to ask that question. Because sometimes, you know, victims, they, they just experienced this traumatic event. You know, they're, they're facing trauma right now. They're, they're feeling, they might not think right away about their pet, especially if there's children in the home. Their, their first, you know, thought might be to protect themselves and the child. So if the question is asked about animal abuse, they might be more inclined to discuss that or, or be like, oh yeah, actually this did happen. He, you know, he kicked the dog when he was running to, to get to me. Um, or he locked the dog in the room because the dog was trying to, to defend me. That also is not uncommon where the pet is actually trying to defend the victim um, during an, an altercation. So, um, you know, working with law enforcement so they can ask those questions too and understand that there is definitely a, a connection. Any questions on that? Okay. So... You? Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you to Ms. Markowitz for reaching out and all the work she did coordinating forms. Thank you to Duke Law School for having such an interest in animals, in animal programs. I think Duke is, to my understanding, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. I am a Fordham Law graduate from 19, I believe, 87. I've been practicing law approximately 30 years, a little under. I'm admitted to practice in the state of New York as well as the state of North Carolina where I have practiced for approximately <clears throat> 12 years. But I spent most of my career in New York, although it's kind of catching up. And um, I started my career in the Bronx District Attorney's Office, which was, um, my dad was a lawyer, and he encouraged me to join the prosecutor's office to do trial work. He was a trial attorney. And he said, you know, if you can try a case, you could do anything. <laughs> So I don't know um, if that's exactly true, but it was very, uh, it turned out to be a very rewarding path. Ultimately, I returned to government, focused on wanting to return to government because that time period in my life as a lawyer was the most rewarding. And so I joined, I was very fortunate to get a job with the Durham County Attorney's Office. It is a civil side of, um, we represent the county in all the actions that they pursue in zoning and civil penalties, and um, we also represent the county commissioners. The Durham County commissioners um, have been committed over a number of years to animal welfare in Durham County. I would say that the three leading 
counties in the state of North Carolina on animal welfare issues and animal law and having a very comprehensive code would be Durham, Buncombe, and New Hanover. And um, those are also the counties wherein law enforcement, specifically the, count, uh, the sheriff, um, is handling law uh, animal abuse issues and all animal welfare issues. With the office of the sheriff, it is a um, elected office. It is a constitutionally created office. It is an office that prior to the statutes in North Carolina, if um, the common law kind of melds with the statutes, if the statute doesn't address something specifically and common law does, the common law, you know, the status of the statutes just totally replace common law in this state. The office of the sheriff is charged with the duty of not just safety and prosecution of criminal cases, but also health and welfare. And under the police powers granted to commissioners by virtue of the statutes, they can control issues concerning animals because of health and welfare of citizens. This is a, um, when I was always, you know, been advising animal control when it was within the county and as well as animal services when the sheriff took it over, one of the primary purposes of animal law is the health of people. Um, we're very concerned about animal abuse, but rabies enforcement and that sort of thing can become very critical as you look at how to handle animal programs in a county. It also can be a way to get an animal away from a very bad situation. The issues that I'm probably the most familiar with here, as Ms. Markowitz mentioned, the legal remedies. What, what can the law do to help animals? Besides the law's charge to protect the welfare and health of citizens that you know the sheriff's charged with, the county's charged with, what can we do to help animals and why should we do it? The law is deficient in this area of animal welfare in that it has not come up and I was discussing this with Ms. Markowitz, so she's going to uh, hear me repeat myself. But the most critical element that I find in animal law, and one of the reasons I have found it fascinating and rewarding, is that the law doesn't have a real good term <laughs> or appropriate term for the protections or the status of animals. The law treats animals as property. And you, can, you will speak to people, or I have in my career, that are married to that. I cannot divorce them from the concept that animals are something more than property. And so I came up with this little uh, hypothetical, which is I own a car outright. It's all mine. I own a 72-acre field, no trees all around. I take the car that I own outright. There's no liens, no bank has any interest. It's only mine. I take an ax to it. I pound the windshield. I pound it to pieces. Nobody's around. It's my own field. I haven't broken any laws. I take that same car and I set it on fire. I have not broken any laws. I take an animal and I take an ax to it. I've broken some laws. I take an animal and I set it on fire. I've broken some laws. So... Conceptually, the law's definition of animals and animals' rights as property falls woefully short of the realities of the law's protections of animals in today's society, as well as the practice of what we do. Nonetheless, it also acts as a continued barrier for improved progress in the area of animal welfare. And yet, there are extreme animal activists. I shouldn't say extreme. That's wrong, because now I give away my prejudice and my opinion. There are animal activists which would say they should have the same rights as people. There was a fascinating article in the New York Times Magazine on the front page. They had a, a woman dressed up 
in sheep's costume. And they said, no animal was harmed in this. And she had all this makeup. And she was dressed as, um, I believe it was a gorilla or an ape or something like that. And she was on the witness stand. There was a case litigating this very issue. Um, and the courts have not embraced it. And I can understand why. Um, we have in the state of um, North Carolina, it is one of the largest importers, I believe, of um, hogs or pigs or however you want to put that. Uh, so you have a big agricultural influence in the state. You have carnivores. My, um, I must say my son is one. He um, he's a, has a food truck, American Meltdown, and he has obviously meat selections on there. And I'm always, he does have vegetarian selections, not vegan. But with that sort of element um, where you, you, you have industry and you have people relying upon produce uh, that consists of um, animal agriculture, how are you possibly going to afford them the same rights as people? And yet, okay, so we understand that. We, so we have two diametrically opposed concepts. One is that they should have equal rights or some maybe enhanced rights akin to what people have or that they're straight up property. They are clearly not straight up property. I mean, you know, the law is just wrong on this. It is not straight up property. But when we talk about seizing animals, we have to talk about the Constitution. Why, why, when, I, when I want to go seize an animal, and um, why do I have to think about the Constitution? Now, me, if I go into court, I usually do it under a civil and we'll talk about that. But if law enforcement wants to, they see an instance, um, I'll give you an example. I wanted Corporal Pinner to come. Unfortunately, she is teaching at the academy. Um, Lieutenant Tech and Corporal Pinner are the um, in charge of animal services over in Durham County. She once just was checking up on a property, following up on something, and she comes across, it's, um, as she's about to follow up, probably you know having to do with the animals, she passes a truck, and inside the truck is a beautiful black shepherd-like, I think it's called M-A-L-A-N-O-I-S. I'm going to say it all wrong. It's a dog like a shepherd that is uh, very dedicated to, they're very smart and they're very good for law enforcement. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, a very well-known breed among law enforcement. This animal is approximately four months old. It is covered in feces and emaciated. God bless her. She took the animal. She took her. Now, the, um, I am not counsel to the sheriff, but she is seizing property without what? A warrant. She's, seizing, she's on somebody's property, and she's seizing property. She had not made an arrest. If she had made an arrest, you could have seized the property pursuant to the arrest, but she didn't make an arrest. She seized the animal, took the animal back to the shelter, um, it was a, the um, the dog was examined by Dr. K. Bishop, who is the vet over at the Durham County Shelter. The dog was K. Bishop described the dog in an affidavit, which I'll get to later. She put her hand straight up and could almost touch the spine. That's how emaciated the dog was. Um, once she puts her hand, you know, in between the legs, and she said, in a few more hours, the dog would have been dead. So, yes. Well, how can you seize an animal? Well, number one, if somebody gives you consent and they're an owner, and if they say they're an owner, the officer can act in good faith. You have a warrant. You need a warrant. What's another circumstance wherein you could seize something like an animal or a child? What's, what's the concept legally in criminal law? Exigent circumstances. So if, the, if in, under your hypothetical, the animal is bleeding to death, they could seize the animal. Exigent circumstances, it's going to die. Corporal Pinner sees this animal. Exigent circumstances. The animal was near death. If you are going to use exigent circumstances as law enforcement, then you have to make sure that it is, in fact, exigent meaning there was a case in North Carolina. Animal control saw horses um, in a field emaciated, and they 
Horses are difficult to take. We've done that in Durham County. You have to find a place to put them. We don't have a shelter to put horses. So you have to start making calls. You need a, you know, refu a, a place that'll take horses as a, uh, animal rescue. And so animal control took two or three days to, I think the case is uh, State versus Nance, took two or three days to find a place to take the horses they took the horses, and the Court of Appeals in the state of North Carolina didn't like that. They said it wasn't exigent. It took you three days to find a place for those horses. That wasn't an emergency, according to the Court of Appeals. So these are the legal roadblocks that you have when you want to seize animals. I do not prefer the criminal remedies um, for various reasons with animals because they're I feel like they should work in conjunction with a civil remedy. The reason I say this is sometimes when you seize an animal, and this is what happened to this dog, this dog's name is Ink, it became Ink because of its beautiful black color. Um, when Corporal Pinner seized this dog, now the dog, now she charged the person, you know, with animal abuse, ultimately, after we had the, you know, after the Dr. K. Bishop examines the dog, um, and after the charge, what happens to the animal? It gets held as evidence. If you are, you know, if you collect drugs or a gun as a police officer, you take the drugs or the gun and you put it into an evidence hold, and it goes in a room, and it's drugs or guns, who cares? Nothing's happening to it. And then when it goes into a, usually police officers have this room locked up, and then you've seen it in the movies. Um, and then when you come to try the case, prosecutor or the officer signs out the evidence and brings it up to the courtroom and tries the case. What are you going to do with an animal? Lots of times, unfortunately, in Durham County, I have seen where animals are held for like a year. One time, they, char they, they seized animals under a criminal warrant. They couldn't find the gentleman against whom the warrant was written. And we had in the Durham County shelter two pit bulls for over a year and it was before I took over animal control, um, and they didn't—they didn't know what they didn't have—they didn't have ownership of the animals. They hadn't prosecuted. The guy went on the lam, so they hadn't got a hold of the gentleman against whom the warrant was. So these dogs are in limbo, and when dogs are in limbo, no matter the breed, something's going to—and they get held in a kennel. What's going to happen to them is they get kennel rage. So. Sometimes a DA will release them on a, you know, they'll do it, but sometimes they don't because they want the um, lawyer, the criminal defense lawyer has a right, obviously, to examine the animal, maybe get feces, find out did the animal have worms very frequently when you're talking about a starvation case. The people charged with um, emaciation or deprivation of food or, and abuse of an animal will claim that the animal was sick and had worms. And if you haven't secured up um, feces test and all of that to show that it hasn't, which we had to do with the horses that we picked up. Before we picked them up, we went and tested the feces in the field. But um, with the case of Inc., I used a civil injunction to get custody of the dog so that the dog would not be held for a year and sustain kennel rage and be useless and have to be put down. It was kind of creative. Um, please forgive me. I am that lawyer. That will be creative. I, I will confess, not every judge has appreciated my creativity. <laughs> it has apparently not deterred me. And um, I pled, um, to get an injunction, you have to show imminent harm. I said the imminent harm was kennel rage. And I had an affidavit from Dr. Kate Bishop, who was an expert, obviously. Uh, she was shelter vet, and she could do that. So when you go into court, if ever you go into court, and to be ultimately effective in changing things up when we talk about animals, if you're not going to be a legislator, court's a great place to, to try those things, to have a good impact. So God bless my dad. God rest his soul. He was right about that. That's a fascinating question. Um, it's a difficult question for me because I don't know the answer. I could tell you nationally, the United States doesn't, federally, doesn't regulate much that's not 
interstate commerce obviously gets triggered. Um, I think they regulate some exotics, but federal law is very, uh, on a national level, ineffective. Any effective programs concerning animals are happening on the local government level. That's where it's happening. I don't know about internationally. Um, I, I, I couldn't answer that. I know that I've been to Paris, and they love their dogs, and they take them everywhere. <laughs> Beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. G give me a sec, yes. Uh, that's a really that's another that's a really good question. There have been cases that have addressed that. I had um, there was a commissioner that I believe her husband taught here at Duke, not the law school. Commissioner Heron. She's she's passed on now, but I loved her very dearly. She was a great public servant. She served as commissioner for oh my god, I think more than thirty years. She used to come into animal. I'm getting to. She used to come into animal advisory meetings, and she'd say. There's, there's slaughtering goats in the front yard. We have to put a stop to this. How do we do this? And of course, I love Commissioner Heron. I went over to, you know, at that time we used Westlaw. We're using Lexus now. But um, to research that. There was in the state of Florida, um, they tried to, not I, one of the counties in Florida, Santeria is a religion that slaughters animals. And Santeria was moving into this county in Florida. And I believe if you wanted to Google the case, you could probably Google Santeria. Um, because it might have been the Church of Santeria, but I, please forgive me for not knowing the case name. I didn't know you were going to ask this very difficult question about religion. But the way this it went, I believe, if memory serves me, it went up to the Supreme Court and the Santeria Church won. Why? Because when the commissioners of that town wanted to regulate the slaughter of animals within their county limits, the issue of the Santa Ria Church was front and center of why they were doing it. Hence, the sole purpose of why they were doing it was to control religion. However, I believe out of Texas there is another case that has controlled the slaughter of animals within city limits, and it was accomplished by the municipality under zoning laws. If you are going to try to regulate the slaughter of animals because you don't want Santeria moving into your town or some other faith that wants to slaughter animals, you will not succeed in the United States because we have freedom of religion. But on the other hand, if like, you don't really want people in, you know, the city of New York, for instance, is a very condensed area. I don't believe that you could slaughter a goat on the sidewalks in the city of New York. Why? Not because you're trying to impede people's religion, but because there's health concerns. It's a city of 9 million people. So it's how you come at something is important. Um, and I, I don't believe you can slaughter animals in the city, but... You know, I, 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 I don't know for sure. <laughs> I didn't start doing animal law until I came here in North Carolina. You had a question. Yeah, so I was, I was sort of curious about why you think there hasn't been more legislation on the issue of, like, animal protections and stuff like that. Because it seems within the past, you know, decade or so, people have just becoming so much more, like, the way we treat, like, dogs and cats and mice, right? They're like uh, children in, in a certain sense. So I'm wondering, like, why with this, like, It's, a, it's an excellent question. I believe here in the state of North Carolina, you would have, let me give you an example of a legislation we passed here in the county. Um, there is an organization called the Coalition to Unchained Dogs. Amanda Arrington founded that organization. What she does is go from town to town to pass anti-tethering laws. We passed one in Durham County. I was loving this law so much, um, and I wish that they could do it all over. They won't be able to do it out in farm. You know, you can't type a dog unattended in Durham County. And they won't be able to do it because of the agricultural influence. And those, you know, industries are not 
motivated by altruism toward animals as much as they are toward profit. And it costs money to, um, you know, have chickens running free. I mean, as a consumer, if you're, go if you're not a vegan, you can pay the $6. I do that. I pay $6 for the range-free chickens. I don't want to, you know, eat eggs from a chicken that was all in a cage. I don't want that. You can control it from a consumer end, but I think that there are powerful influences um, that would hinder that legislation. And certainly in, with tethering, that's a perfect example in the state of North Carolina where you to look at that, you know. Absolutely. You are so on that. California, I think, had a um, proposition to pass, and I'm, I can't recall if they passed it. Please forgive my rustiness, but um, they had a proposition. It was uh, largely uh, the Humane Society was a proponent wherein they were trying to get more humane conditions for animals. There is a movie with uh, Claire Dane, I believe, and she played somebody. Um, what was the name of that movie where they? she was, I believe she was autistic, and she... Um, advocated for the handling of cows before slaughter to be like in tunnels and it made them much calmer. So it was sort of a, um, a way to handle, you're gonna slaughter them for food, but you don't have to be cruel in the process. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we're running, <coughs> sorry, running a little short in time. I wanted to give Liz a chance to have any, if you had any final things that you'd wanted to say with everyone's finished passing around the papers, if you had any other comments. I'd like just to piggyback off what she said, how animals are viewed as kind of like a property or possession. You'll see that in that um, when you get a chance to look at it, it says like, it basically terms it as I want possession of, as you would want possession of a car. So you'll see the way it's written. I just can I just say one thing? The law's challenge, and you, you, I, I, I want, I believe you probably are all brilliant in this room. The law's challenge is to come up with a term that is somewhere between property and people for animals. I don't think it's done it yet. Well, I want to thank our panelists so much for coming. If you all had follow up questions you still want to ask, I'm sure. Well, hopefully they'll be willing to stick around for a minute or two if you want to come up and ask them additional questions, but thank you all for coming, and thank you again to a wonderful Thank panelists. you, it's a privilege. Yeah, I wish you the best in your careers.